Let's bring in Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson joins us live tonight back in L.A. Uh, Matt, great to see you tonight. Um, why do you look happier when you're in Los Angeles? Well, why is that? Because I have a bit of a tan. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so um, tell us about the opening statements in, the, in this case. Well, the opening statements, I mean, at first, I just want to talk about the gallery. Wow. Um, Jane Doe, number one, still on the stand today, and that's where I left off. She's going to be back on the stand, called again tomorrow, possibly day three for her. She's going to be under uh, cross-examination there. And she looked out at the gallery, and at one point, she answered a question, and she said, half of the gallery here is either friends of Masterson or they are Scientologists. And... He looked over at his friends that are sitting right behind him, some family members and obviously church members, like he he did during those opening statements yesterday. And these were some key takeaways that he was listening to as he leans back in his chair, he sucks on a piece of hard candy and shows little emotion. His, uh, the, the deputy DA in this case said this, and this was the big takeaway of opening statements. He said, um, we're gonna paraphrase, Two women became woozy or passed out after a couple drinks and were tossed in his hot tub. One of them he then dragged to his bed where she regained consciousness to find him having sex with her. A third woman, ex-girlfriend, that's Jane Doe number three in all of this, said that she woke up to find him on top of her. Well, as for the defense attorney, uh, the defense not really um, objecting to a lot during testimony today, but very fiery yesterday. He said this quote, the reason the allegations have so much in common is that the alleged victims violated a detective's warning not to speak to each other and had cross pollinated their accounts and undermined their credibility. That's something that he doubled down on today when he was um, cross examining Jane Doe number one, he said, what were the dates exactly that you reached out to the other Jane Doe's in this in this case? That's interesting. Uh, it, it seems the defense is going to go down the avenue of, OK, a little bit of collusion, like piling on, getting our story straight, showing a pattern. Um, that's that's going to be interesting to see what the jury does with that. Um, talk to us a little bit more about Jane Doe number one and, and, and her testimony. Well, it was a long, lengthy day of testimony today here in California. And again, as I mentioned before, she's going to be called back to the stand tomorrow. But here were some takeaways from her testimony today. And um, this was really the theme of the day. And again, we're paraphrasing. There are no cameras in this courtroom, so bear with us. So Jane Doe, number one, outlined how she tried to push him away as Masterson continued to have sex with her and smothered her, according to her. She said, quote, I couldn't breathe. He said, uh, she said that she had a pillow on her face and she went unconscious. She also went on to say that she noted his face during some of these attacks, according to her, and she had never seen his face like that before. He was going to kill me, quote. Um, and then she broke down on the stand and said, you know, I, I just can't do this. And that's understandable, you know, someone that's reliving trauma in their eyes. Absolutely. Um, let's get back to what you noticed inside the courtroom. Is it... Is it a Hollywood scene? Is it are, are some of his Hollywood friends there, or is it more of a Scientology scene, or both? I think it's a little bit of both because you also have the Hollywood Scientology Center not too far away from the courthouse, outside the courthouse, which is across from where they shot La La Land, the city hall that's very famous. And I think that this is the same courthouse for O.J. Simpson or it's next door, but they were shooting a movie in the parking lot area. So it's very Hollywood before you even step in those courthouse doors. Well, inside we're expecting a lot of big names to take the stand, especially Lisa Marie Presley. Everybody's ears perked up when we heard that name. And her name is being brought up because um, allegedly Master Sin had told um, one of the Jane Doe's, Jane Doe number one, not to uh, discuss the attack with Lisa Marie. So that must have been in some sort of church setting, we're guessing. Um, Chrissy Bixler's ex-husband or husband um, is also expected to take the stand and Jordan Ladd. And then we left the day with out of the presence of the jury, Vinny, they were saying that Marty Singer is expected to take the stand tomorrow at the end of the day. All right. He's back in Hollywood. Matt Johnson. Awesome. Thank you very much, sir. We'll speak again.
Let's bring in our think tank. Joining us tonight in Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy, out in Los Angeles, of course, a former federal prosecutor, author of the new book, Harvard to Hashtag, My Journey from Big Law to Big to Business Owner. Nima Romani is with us. And in Phoenix, Arizona, the attorney who represented Jody Arias and the author of the book series Trapped with Ms. Arias, Kirk Nurmi is with us. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, all right. Eklund, I'll begin with you. This is going to be another one of those cases where you're going to have multiple accusers come in. Um, I've got to think that is an enormous advantage for prosecutors. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's a, this is a hard ball to fumble. Um, I, I really think that uh, they have enough evidence. They have, um, not only do they have the evidence and they also have the timing, right? With everything that's been going on, we have seen, you know, with the Me Too movement and just domestic violence um, and just bringing awareness to that, it really does not help um, Mr. Masterson. And, and also his celebrity isn't really holding that much weight with the general public as it would have had maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So um, it's, it's, it's going to be an interesting trial. All right, Nima Romani, you're in the middle of it all. Um, let me ask you about what, uh, pick up on what Eklund's talking about. Um, celebrity, my, my, my impression generally is that in Los Angeles, you're a celebrity on trial, you have an advantage. It's like home court advantage because that's the that's the industry that's what drives los angeles that's what drives hollywood right um but you also have the additional factor here of scientology is that a plus is that a minus is that going to be a factor in all of this oh it's a huge factor Vinny, and i agree i mean being a celebrity defendant here in la is a huge advantage but scientology is not because there's been a lot of documentaries that have come out recently and that's why the defense has desperately tried to keep it out and you see the Dis deputy district attorney pounding scientology so much the judge says listen stop you're really going too far so scientology is not helpful in this case and really it's really the prosecution's theory of the case the victims went to the ethics officer that's why they didn't report it contemporaneously to, you know, whether it's a hospital, law enforcement, whatnot. So the big theme for the district attorney's office here. All right, Kirk, what do you think? You know, we've we, we've got Harvey Weinstein's being tried, right, at, at the same time. Different case, different guy, not really a celebrity, more of a uh, former movie mogul uh, slash disgusting person. Um, but let's talk about the... the the Me Too factor, right? Where we are with that? Where's the pendulum at this point swinging on that? Is there more of a presumption against someone who's facing multiple accusers? Has it come back to the middle? Um, what do you think here? I think we're working our way back towards the middle, Vinny. I think there's three things I would disagree with Eklund. I think the prosecution really kind of has an uphill battle here because we got 20-year-old allegations, right? And then we have the CSI effect, what we call the CSI effect, because there's going to be no physical evidence to support the claims of these victims. Next. What do we have? We have the influence of Scientology. As Nima points out, this is going to be a big, important, crucial factor. Is, are this, is the state going to be able to convince the jurors that Scientology stood in the way, that Scientology is the reason they don't have the evidence? That could be strike number two for the state, and strike number three could be exactly what you brought up, Vinny, what I would call maybe the Amber Heard effect, right? We heard Amber Heard take the stand, and you have to know that a lot of those jurors were aware of and or watched that trial and saw Miss Heard get up there and make accusations about Johnny Depp, sexual allegations, deep sexual misconduct that the majority of people believe that were not true. So that presumption that might have been given to these victims years ago, I think has been wiped out by some of these cultural shifts like Depp v. Heard, which I think is a cultural shift. So I think it's going to be very hard for the state. I think they've got three strikes against them. And obviously, we're going to see how it plays out. But they're going to have to overcome three big obstacles in order to gain a conviction, in my opinion. Opinion. All right. Uh, by the way, folks, we're going to have coverage of this trial like no other network. Matt Johnson on the ground in L.A. He'll be inside that courtroom and a report on everything that happens. Make sure you're watching uh, to get the latest details on that each and every night.